a KP tau function, there are many kinds of tau functions, but the basic idea is that a KP tau function, which is the generic one, is a function of an infinite sequence of variables, real or complex, T1, T2, uh, which satisfies an infinite system of bilinear equations, bilinear differential equations or difference equations. And there's a very nice, neat way, due to Sato, he invented the tau function, to summarize all of these this, oh, the equations are called Hirota equations, and to summarize the content in one single equation. And the single equation involves four parameters, because really there's an infinite number of equations, Z1 through Z4, and we define associated to the tau a translation of the vector T by uh, two elements, uh, one for each pair IJ, and these elements are very familiar. They are essentially the different terms in the in the Taylor series of log of 1 minus z. And we define this quantity, it's anti-symmetric by construction because we multiply by zi minus zj, and the single equation tells us that if you think of this as a two-form, in uh, an element of wedge 2, c4, it's decomposable. That's the one condition, and that's exactly the quadric that embeds the Grassmannian of two planes into projective five space. That one equation, expanded identically in all the parameters z1, z2, z3, z4, contains the infinity of all Hirota bilinear equations, and that you can go home and teach to your children. It's that simple. Not the way it's usually presented, but it's the easiest way. What does it mean? Well, the usual trick is we identify another thing called the Baker or baker akiezer function, which depends on an additional spectral parameter, z, in this formal way. We translate tau, again, by one of these terms, z inverse, square bracket. We multiply it by the infinite exponential series. For the moment, I'm not going to worry about convergence. It's just a formal thing. And differentiating with respect to the exponents and the arguments, it turns out that if the hirota bilinear equations are satisfied, then the psi satisfies an infinite sequence of evolution equations generated by some differential operators di, ordinary linear differential operators di, in the first variable, which is called x. t1 is x. And this infinite sy system has compatibility conditions because they're all satisfied simultaneously. And that is the so-called cadon set really hierarchy, of which we saw uh, one of the generic case, the cadon set really equation, written on the board a few times. So this is the hierarchy. This is the way you construct solutions. What does it mean, and why the heck do we care? the question. How to construct such tau, tau functions, what do they mean? Now I'm going to tell you how con to construct all tau functions by a kind of algebraic trick based on Grassmannians, but now it's going to be infinite Grassmannians. We had one Grassmannian relation, a Brücker relation, one for Grassmannian of two planes in C4, but since it was a four-parameter family of things, it actually won't we won't be surprised that in fact it, it contains equivalently some Brücker relations for an infinite Grassmannian. So here's a model. You take a model for Hilbert space. I like this model. If you don't want it, take any model of a denumerable, countable, uh, separable Hilbert space with a, an orthonormal basis, EI. I'm taking L2S1 with the monomials as the basis. And so H plus is the positive monomials, H minus is the minus. For those who like analysis, the H plus is essentially the H2 Hardy space. So that means that the, you can think of this as Fourier series which extend either holomorphically to the inside or the outside of the unit circle. The Grassmannian is modeled on this subspace, H+, plus, which is roughly half the total space. So it contains subspaces of the same infinite uh, nature as H+, plus of H, which are closed, and are commensurable with H+, plus, which means the orthogonal projection from these elements, W of the Grassmannian to H+, plus, is a Fredholm operator. So, and we want that, so it should, in some sense, be close to H+, plus. it's got a finite index, and it should be small as far as the complementary projection to H- minus is concerned. One choice which one sees in the literature uh, is that it should be a compact operator. So this is Fredholm, this is compact. Or if you don't like those, there are algebraic uh, criteria which refer to convergence or rapid convergence, but this is the, I'm using the definitions that appear in the classic paper by Graham Siegel and George Wilson. Those are the main references. Sato, Siegel, and Wilson. 
So here's the orthonormal basis. The reason why we've reversed the signs here in the basis is because we want the Dirac C to consist of, eventually, to consist of all negative, not positive states filled. And we want the Dirac C, you'll see in a moment, what that is to correspond to the H plus of space. So that's why we reverse the signs in the monomials. So the positive subspace is labeled by the negative basis elements. Okay, take a, uh, such a W, uh, take a basis, span of W1, et cetera, expand the, uh, each of these basis elements in the standard basis, EJ, that forms a doubly infinite by singly infinite rectangular matrix. So the I indices go from uh, uh, zero to plus infinity. The J indices go from minus infinity to plus infinity. Here's our matrix. And now, if you're familiar with Grassmannians, you'll recognize these as homogeneous coordinates for an infinite Grassmannian. So the homogeneous coordinates uh, with columns, these infinite, doubly infinite column vectors, like this. And uh, now we introduce some canonical group actions, because the uh, Karonsev Petrius really hierarchy will really be an integrable hierarchy. So we can expect that there's going to be, in the sense of integrable systems, an, an abelian group acting, which is in some sense maximal. So this is what is canonical. The Grassmannian and the group action is canonical. It's given once and for all. And every other, every solution, all of the things we've been seeing in the transparency are special cases of flows, of, of orbits of this group. And the only difference is what is the initial point. So it's labeled by elements of the Grassmannian. So here's the two groups. Multiplication by a positive exponential linear series in, in the parameters or a negative one. That's called gamma plus, gamma minus. If you like, think of this as shift operators. The multiplication of the monomials by z is a shift operator. So if you want to use the basis, lambda is the basis, and then equivalent is just a, a matrix representation, is for an element, remember this is a rectangular matrix multiplied on the left by a doubly infinite matrix, which consists of the exponentials of the powers of the shift matrix. So this is called shift flows, plus and minus shift flows. Those are special elements of a bigger group, which is, I won't try to define this, but there is something like a GL of the Hilbert space H. So one has to put in some constraints to make sure that makes sense. One has to be able to take determinants, finite determinants, and so on. But there's a good definition of a, generally, of a general linear action on the Grassmannian, which is lifted from, I mean, in the obvious way, from an action on the Hilbert space. So uh, for simplicity, let us take only exponential elements. So those look like the exponent. Matricially, these would be represented on the first, on the H, by this matrix, e to the A. And this should be thought of as an element of the GL infinity, the algebra. Then the definition of the tau function is the following. Take an, any element of the Grassmannian and let it flow. Look at the orbit under gamma plus t. I'm only speaking of kp right now. If we had. Uh, two tota, we would have both gamma plus and gamma minus. But right, uh, actually, it wouldn't act on the Grassmannian or a flag variety. But I'm only doing KP. So we, have, we only have this one group, gamma plus, which acts in, by, uh, by the uh, left multiplication by the exponential of the linear shift up, uh, powers of the shift operator. This needs some precision, but the basic elementary idea is take the moving point on the orbit, W of t, projected orthogonally to H plus, pretend this is a map in the same space and take its determinant. That quotation marks is the subtlety of the thing because you can't really take the determinant of a map from one space to another. You have to have a, a, a comparable equivalence between the two spaces. But that's not hard to do. There's a subtlety in that, which those who, OK, I'm anticipating a little bit. I guess most of the audience consists of algebraic geometers. So let me refer a little bit to, I'm going to anticipate Plicker embeddings in a moment. Uh, is this the moment to do it? Anyway, let, let me finish this. The tau function, according to this definition, if you think of this as being the H plus subspace and the H minus subspace, it's the determinant of this infinite matrix. This is a singly infinite but singly infinite matrix. It's determinant. I should put quotation marks around because there's a question of subtlety uh, in the uh, which I'll get back to later on, which leads to only projective representations when we are in the 
scheme that we want, which is really the infinite wedge product scheme. But let's take this as the definition. Now, so what? I've just defined this bizarre thing. Theorem, due to Sato, a function tau of an infinite number of variables in some formal sense is a tau function, that is, it satisfies the infinite system of Hirota by linear equations, if and only if it is such a thing with some functional analytic details that are not going to work. At a formal algebraic level, this is how you should think of the dress magnet. The projection to the, the uh, starting point base space of a, an orbit of the abelian group gamma plus within the infinite dress magnet and its determinant. That is the tau function. And there are various ways to see why this is necessary and sufficient condition for being a tau function. I'm going to anticipate it. Uh, being all algebraic geometers, you all know what the Pricker embedding is. A Grassmannian is an algebraic variety. It's an infinite algebraic variety. You have to embed it in some projective space. And the projective space, if you've studied Griffiths and Harris, is, the inf is in this case infinite. In Griffiths and Harris, it would be the wedge product space. Why the wedge product space? If, uh, let's go back a moment, a little lesson in uh, elementary algebraic geometry. Um, if you take k planes in n dimensions, you know which page of Griffiths and Harris, that if you look at the dual determinantal line bundle over that Grassmannian, its holomorphic sections are isomorphic to lambda k cn. It's the wedge product space. That's your fermionic representations. That's your wedge product representation. So it's representing actions, lifts of the action on the Grassmannian to the sections, holomorphic sections of a line bundle and, that, and you count the sections, it's, it's got exactly n choose k, uh, linear independent sections. We're doing this in infinite dimensions. So instead of n choose k, we're going to have two infinity choose infinity. It makes no sense. We take the full wedge product space on the, on the base space, h. And that, I'll define that in a minute. And that is what's called a fermionic representation or the wedge product representation. So all of you who have been struggling with reading of Kumko's papers, you will be able to read it after this talk. <laughs> I haven't got to the fermions, but I'm anticipating it. But now I want to because I've got this determinant, and I'm, I have a guilty conscience about writing that formula because I know it's not really a legitimate formula because of the fact that these are two different spaces. There's a subtlety which has to do with admissible holomorphic sections. You cannot really take any infinite dimensional holomorphic sections, admissible sections. There's a theorem which is rather, for me, rather deep functional analysis. You can find it in Siegel and Wilson's paper. I'll give the reference afterwards. Which says that if we know a holomorphic section evaluated only over the orbits of gamma plus, there's a unique extension to the full Grassmann. So, they, so it's sufficient to think of the, of the sections as simply being defined over an orbit. In other words, on the group gamma plus. Uh, however, when thinking about determinants, what you're really doing is you're acting on the determinant of the line bundle. So you pick some section, which may be an admissible one in some sense, in the sense that the relevant operators are trace class or have determinants, etc. And then you apply the group action the way one typically does in uh, geometric representation theory to the base, and this lifts naturally to the holomorphic sections. But this may not be an admissible section. You have to compare the two, the old and the new, and the ratio of those two will be the tau function. That's the way that Siegel and Wilson define it, rather than just this. So what happens? What happens is that you might pick up a central extension. Uh, what commutes in the, as an action on the H Hilbert space, when it's acting on the wedge product space, may only commute up to a projective factor. Okay? That's the central extension. So it will be a representation, but not exactly the same group, but a central extension of the group. And that's exactly what happens. That's an important fact. The gamma plus and gamma minus uh, flow groups, up and down shift flows, on the Hilbert space commute. On the wedge product space, they do not commute. There's a central factor, which is very important in all computations. So, so is the representation on the Hilbert space, the one you've got there, is it faithful? Is it faithful? I'm just Yes. Sort of yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it faithful? Well, you're asking, is there a, on the Hilbert space, there's, yeah, it's faithful. On the H. Uh, okay. So the, here's the key thing. The bottom of this slide 
tells you everything about tau functions. Clicker relations. Any, um, any element, any decomposable element in the wedge product space is the image of a Grassmannian element and vice versa. That goes back to, to uh, maybe Grassmann. Um, and the here are the bilinear equations, even though they're differential, bilinear differential equations, are exactly equivalent in contact to the in, the con, in content to the Plücker relations, which are quadratic relations for the Plücker coordinates. We'll get to that in a second. So really, this purely geometrical statement that we are on a decomposable element in the wedge product space is equivalent to the Hirota bilinear relations. Why? Why is it a differential equation? Because there's something canonical behind it. The time dependence is fixed once and for all. If you have the Plücker relations satisfied at the initial point, you'll have it all along the flow. And so there's nothing to add on that. The only data is which orbit are you on. And that is told by the initial point. So in fact, those Hirota bilinear equations and the Plücker relations are exactly, they have exact same content. And this was Sato's main contribution to have discovered this. Because the Hirota equations existed before Sato in example. He unified this by introducing the notion of Plücker relations on an infinite OK, now, before I go to my first example of a, well, here's an example of a tau function, a sure function. Every partition, uh, by partition, I just mean a weakly decreasing non-negative sequence of integers, which eventually saturate in 0. So it's an infinite sequence, but it ends after a finite number of terms, the number of terms is called the length of the partition. After that, it becomes zero. Just like an ordinary finite dimensional Grassmannian, partitions label um, a lot of things. They label um, coordinate patches on the Grassmannian, and they label Flicker coordinates. They also label cells. So they're the fundamental thing, which I suppose all of you know. Anyway. Sure functions can be thought of, as, one way to think of them is as uh, characters for irreducible representations, tensor representations of GLN. But that presumes an auxiliary set of variables, so you can think of the TIs as the trace invariants of some element of GLN. If you express it in terms of the eigenvalues of G, assuming it's diagonalizable, you get the standard um, bialternate formula, which is a ratio of two determinants in the eigenvalues. That bialternate formula is also known as the vial character formula, and it was discovered by Jacobi long before group theory existed. Sure functions were, my first reference to sure function is Legendre. So sure wasn't even a, a twinkle in the eye of his parents at the time that sure functions were being used. They're simply examples of symmetric polynomials in many variables. OK, and thought of in terms of these <coughs> T trace invariant variables, they are tau functions. It's the basic building block for all tau functions is sure functions. Every tau function can be written as a possibly infinite linear combination of sure functions. And what are the coefficients? Nothing but the Plücker coordinates of the Grassmann. So to know the Plücker coordinates of the Grassmann is to know the tau function. We'll get back to that later on. But also, I'd like to mention for most of you that if you've studied Schubert cohomology, you know that, that the Schur functions evaluated in the appropriate generators in, in terms of the, actually the Chern classes of the tautological bundles of the various cells in the Grassmannian, the, that generates the full cohomology of the Grassmannian. So you, without knowing it, have been speaking prose all your life. Monsieur, who? Jordan. As Monsieur Jordan said, if you've considered Schubert calculus, you already know the basic building block of tau functions, uh, namely Schubert functions. Interpreted cohomologically exactly the way that we this week have been interpreting generating functions for moduli invariants in terms of uh, churn classes, pulled back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's already in Schubert cohomology. The idea of that is already in that. OK, so sure, so we've got, we think of these as symmetric polynomials in, let's say, the eigenvalues, or if you like, these, they're just elements of a ring, a commutative ring, which is generated by the Chern classes of the total energy bundles. OK, so the first example, ah, I didn't tell you how, how it's a 
function. So you need to know what W is, the starting point, and that tells you the tau function. So what is it? Uh, do I have it here? Yes. Take the basis elements here, basis elements associated to this partition. This is the, you write down not the parts of the partition, but that shifted by I. This frequently appears in all formulas for the coefficients and the expansions. That makes it a strictly decreasing, not a weakly, but a strictly decreasing uh, sequence, which eventually saturates in all the negative numbers. And take the, those basis elements, they span a subspace, call it W lambda. Take the determinant of W lambda, and that's the lambda of Plucker coordinate of W. That's exactly, if you think about it, the definition of the Plucker coordinate. We'll see it in another way in a moment, but the determinant of this. Okay. Take that W lambda, that one thing. Um, no, that's not quite right what I said. Uh, this is a, a canonical element of the Grassmannian associated to lambda. The Plucker coordinates for an arbitrary element are obtained by taking the projection onto this. So the Plucker coordinates for an arbitrary. But anyway, so we have these elements associated to each partition. Compute the uh, tau function as previously defined, the determinant, and magic, you obtain the sure function. It's a little exercise, which I suggest everyone try. Okay, so that's one class of tau functions. Here's another one, random matrices. Introduce for any given measure, let's say on some curved segments in the complex plane, or if you want to fix ideas, just the real line, a measure. It doesn't have to be a pro uh, positive or even real measure, but let's say it's positive and real, then it's a probability measure, and you, we can use it later on to define a random process. Take the span of the orthogonal polynomials associated to that measure, starting at n, going up, and just shift it backwards, because for a simple reason, I want a Laurent tail, which starts with 1 over z. Take that as an element of the Grassmannian, and so here the orthogonal polynomials, and Sir, you, just one moment, uh, the tau function as previously defined, you compute it, and it's given by this integral, which anyone who's touched random matrices immediately recognizes as, a, as the reduced integral for a normal matrix model. The power 2 here tells you that it's normal matrices, and that's just the uh, van der Mollen determinant. Here's your exponential flow factor, which is really driving the thing. So it's a deformation of Lebesgue measure by the exponential flow factor, and it, an interaction term which presents, prevents this from being a product measure. The zi's, we'll see in a moment, are interpreted as the eigenvalues of a random matrix. Who wanted to ask a question? Yes. Is it true that uh, pi is a polynomial, of polynomial of degree i? Defined as that. Oh, you want to know the normalization? Um, no, th this is, uh, it's not, it's not uh, monic, if that's what you ask. It's not it? monic. No, no it's, it's normalized so that this is one. Yeah. Yeah. If it were monic, you wouldn't have one there. But of degree y. No, degree y, I. yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. It's degree yeah. i, but it's, it's normalized by this. So, so you could normalize it so it's monic, so it's, then you'd have some. Okay, so here's a, this is just a fact, but it's also a calculation that can be done half a page. I suggest you do it. Homework exercise number two. Prove that this is really what results from the determinant calculation. And the reason why that's good is because by the vial integral integration formula for UN, that is nothing but the total integral of a deformed measure on the space, let's say, okay, here I wrote Hermitian matrices. It would be Hermitian if the eigenvalues lie on the real. If they don't, they can be anywhere. Uh, it, it's a special class of normal matrices, but it's, then the eigenvalues could be in the complex plane. But the point is that you do have a measure, a deformed measure, the original Lebesgue measure on, let's say, the Hermitian matrices, with, again, this exponential flow factor, which now appears in terms of the trace invariance of the matrices. So this family, infinite family of measures, which can be probability measures if we choose the right positivity conditions, this thing projects to, uh, to a measure on the uh, eigenvalue space. And you can, and it was the previous transparency that gives you that. You look at the z's here as the eigenvalues. This is exactly the same integral up to a normalization factor, which is essentially the volume of the group UN. 
And so we've written that um, the partition function for a random matrix model is a tau function. Third example, coming closer to the interests of this group, is the convection. This is a little subtle. This is not exactly analytically correct in terms of Sato, but the idea is the same. So here we have this lovely ratio of these integrals, the considered integral, which involves an n to the cube factor and a lambda squared factor. And we think of the ti's as being certain every odd tra negative trace invariant. The externally coupled lambda, notice that didn't appear in the previous one. The ti's were independent parameters. Here they're determined by some matrix which has the same size as, as this one, but we're going to let that size go to infinity. So in fact, there is an infinite number of independent ti's on the limit. And those will be the Konsevich witten generating parameters in the expansion. John, then we have the usual, sorry? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but why do you have lambda squared? I think lambda why squared lambda is squared? Is the first degree. Because that's what Konsevich chose. Well, Konsevich chose lambda and then yeah, lambda squared. Oh, because I got that that's the, oh, sorry, the measure. Know. And lambda is diagonal. I'm Since sorry. It's diagonal. Is, no, 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 Peter's right. I, that's a typo. It should be lambda n squared. He's right. It's lambda n squared, not lambda yeah. squared n. You're right. I'm uh, sorry. No, no, but it's a good point. I'm glad you said it because I'm going to come back to this type of thing before. So let's get it straight. It is lambda n squared. No. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. No, no, you're wrong. It's lambda squared n. This is correct. No, no, it's lambda n squared. <laughs> let's look at the paper. Okay, let's not get stuck on this. It's either lambda n squared or lambda n squared. And you're right, you can convert one into the other by translating n by a constant. So, so you can convert one into the other anyway. But I believe that the original form, if you look up Konsevich's paper, is the lambda n squared. You're right, you're right. Okay, okay. It's Mia right. culpa, you're right. No, no, but I mean, it's, a trivial, it's a trivial change, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Okay, I'm going to look at other models later on. The Brezan Hikami. Who was doing Brezan Hikami? Shadrin. You were doing Brezan Hikami. That's, this is... The concept was not Brezan No. If it were lambda n, it would be Brezan Okay, anyway, you can convert these things into each other by completing the square or translating or something like that. So it's not important. Take this, okay, change this, this two to that one. And this to that. Okay? More basic questions. Okay, let's not get stuck on this, please. It's just one example. This is the well-known, even if there's a typo, Kotsevich integral. The, the uh, logarithm can be expanded in terms of the gromov witten invariance. That's what Kotsevich proved. And this is a tau function. That's the only point I want to say. If you ask me which tau function, well, if you look at Kotsevich, which is all <coughs> filled with mistakes on the second part, um, it is essentially, formally, if this were really a matrix model, the spectrum would have to be taken on the convergent paths of the airy integrals. So what it is is an asymptotic expansion to the airy function and its derivatives taken on those paths in the complex plane. There are three of them where they converge. There's a lot of nonsense in the proof first given by Konsevich and proved afterwards by Isaacs and Zubat. But essentially, the element W of your Hilbert space is spanned by the asymptotic series for the airy function and all its derivatives, just like the polynomials before gave us our other one. This one, the airy function, doesn't. Okay, so there's the third example, and now we're touching moduli space invariants. Okay, now let's get to the Fermi box space. So remember not to be frightened. You're familiar with this already. It's just an exterior space. It's exactly the space of holomorphic sections of the dual determinantal line bubble, if that's easier for you. For me, this is easy. For every partition and every integer, we can extend the partition to an infinite sequence and associate what in the literature is called the particle positions, which are distinct. We think of the particles as lo located on the integer lattice, on the real line, and they're fermions. They cannot occupy the same site, hence the L's have to all be distinct. Every partition pair, lambda and M, corresponds to a set of occupied and unoccupied sites, and these are called a Maya diagram, and you can use the Tau function to define random processes of such Maya diagrams, particle processes. But really, there are partitions. We take semi-infinite wedge product space of H with itself, which is split up into sectors, which are the, the uh, different, in which, I didn't talk about topology, but the infinite Grassmannian actually has an infinite number of connected components. 
And the Plücker map is going to take us into the different sectors called the charred sectors of Fn, where by definition, the basis of these are spanned by the basis elements lambda n, where lambda is a partition, these are the occupation numbers, consisting of the wedge product of those basis elements consisting of the particle positions, L1, L2, etc. So it's semi-infinite sequence bond. And each one has a sort of center of gravity, if you look at the Maya diagram, and that's n. n is the Fredholm index of the Grassmannian projection, which we said was finite. And in this context, it's called the, the charge of the particle, or the total. The, we have one vacuum. For every trivial partition lambda, we have a vacuum. So we have one for each integer. And these are called the charge sectors. So I'm going to be, when I talk about the charge sectors, from the viewpoint of Grassmannians, it means the Fredholm index of the orthogonal projection operator. From the viewpoint of, uh, of exterior spaces, it's, it's just uh, where you're, where, what the Dirac C is, what is the level of the Dirac C, which the vacuum is exactly all occupied sites up to level N. And we're looking at perturbations of that. So here we have a pair, an integer and a partition, labeling all of the basis states in our exterior product space in a unique way. Recall that these were our basis elements. We need the dual basis elements also, H star. And the Fermi creation and annihilation operators are exterior multiplication by the basis elements or interior uh, uh, multiplication by the dual basis elements. That's called psi i of psi i's dagger, and that in the literature of the Fermi creation and annihilation operators. They satisfy, they, they define, there's a tautological like, uh, who, yeah, like Kazarian mentioned, there's a tautological, well, because of the pairing, you can put a quadratic form, he put a symplectic form onto h plus h star. Actually, it wasn't the same age. But whenever you have a vector space in this dual, there's a, a, a canonical quadratic form uh, where each of the two pieces are totally isotropic and they're dual to each other. And then you can make it either symmetric or anti-symmetric. So here it's symmetric, you have a quadratic form. These are the Clifford algebra relations corresponding to the infinite orthogonal group of that quadratic form. OK, Pricker map, just like in finite dimensions, the span of W1 and W2 goes to the exterior product of the elements, projectivized because if you change the basis, you'll multiply by the determinant of the change of basis. And we still have the orthogonal projection as before. And so this is the definition of the Plücker coordinates. If you take the Plücker map and expand it in our standard basis, the coefficients are the Plücker coordinates. If you think about it, Plücker coordinates are determinants. It's exactly what I said before. It's the same thing as taking your semi-infinite, uh, doubly infinite by singly infinite matrix W, picking out the rows corresponding to the particle locations associated with the partition, shifted by N, looking at the minor of that, taking its determinant. That's exactly what this is. If you think about what a wedge product means, it's exactly what it is. You determine the scalar product with the, uh, of this with uh, the vacuum gives you the trigger point, and that's a determinant. And we have an infinite set of Plücker relations because of the fact that these are decomposable elements. OK, so now we've embedded. Now let's look at the gamma plus minus action. That has to be lifted to the space of holomorphic sections, which is the wedge product space. And the lift operatorially is very easy to describe. These are the shift flows, this gamma hat. As a physicist, I call this the second quantized version. The first quantized, if you think of, uh, of Quantum mechanics versus quantum field theory, this is the terminology one uses. Let's say the, the space of wave functions for a many particle system, the space of wave functions is the first quantized Hilbert space on, the, on which the Schrodinger equation can be written. This, the, uh, the Fox space is the space of occupations of, with variable numbers, and that either involves a symmetric infinite product of the first quantized Hilbert space or a skew symmetric. One is bosons, the other is fermions. We're talking about fermions, and that's why the skew symmetric product of the Hilbert space is the second quantized so-called fermionic Fox space. That's physicist language. Here are the generators. We've got the, the, uh, the currents turn out to be represented by bilinears in the Fermi creation and the dilation. This is very easy to see. But remember, we have picked up our central extension. So the positive current generators, J plus, which represent the gamma plus group, and the minus ones, which represent the minus group, no longer commute with each other. There's a central extension 
and anyone doing calculations will just realize that at some point the center of syndrome comes up and it, it, it depends on how you sum a certain apparently divergent infinite series. So these are sometimes called the current components. In any case, they generate the shift flows. So a general group element, which is of exponential type, e to the a, can be represented also as the exponential of such a bilinear expression in a Fermi equation of normalization. So that's a typical thing. And now let's write the tau function in terms of this data. So we choose some vacuum. There's an integer which tells us it's the charge 0, charge 1, etc. vacuum. For most purposes, it's sufficient to choose 0 here. But in some of the formulae that we've seen on the blackboard, n was different from 0. That's the lattice location. When we talk about two total lattice, the n tells you the lattice site. So that's important. But if you only look at kp, then you don't need that. So this is, believe it or not, equivalent, if you think about it, it's equivalent to the previous definition in terms of determinants. But we may write this business of admissible section. So we take, this is the famous formula due to Sato and his uh, group. It goes back to the late 1970s, 1980. You take the vacuum state expectation value. Now there's the scalar product of two things. The vacuum, the nth charge vacuum, and the vacuum acted upon by two things. First of all, a group element. The group element is the thing that creates W out of H plus. So we're looking at the group orbit. Grassmann is a homogeneous space for GL infinity, GLH. And so every element of the Grassmannian is a GLH image of the origin. Of course, there's a stabilizer, so G is not unique. But it's equivariant. The stabilizer of H plus is the same as the stabilizer of the vacuum in the second quantum. So although g hat can be replaced by anything on the right that stabilizes the right-hand uh, ket vector, um, that's, it's equivariant. The, this, this inter, uh, the, the two actions are interlaced by the Pripyat map. Then we have the representation of the flow group. So now this is exactly the Pricker image of W of t. This is the Pricker image of W, and this is the Pricker image of W of t. Now you take its Pricker coordinate by scalar product in it with the vacuum, with the vacuum, but this is the flowing element. So the, the zeroth Bricker coordinate of the moving element is the tau function. But if you know just the zeroth, just the zeroth Bricker coordinate for all times, you can uniquely determine all the Bricker coordinates for time equal to zero, because it's a standard group action. To see that, we'll see it in the next slide, right? it's true. Okay. When, uh, I'm going to rapidly jump to the case of two tota, where we have not just the gamma plus flows, which are on the left, but also gamma minus flows on the right under an arbitrary group element in the middle. And that, so that depends on three types of variables. A single integer, positive or negative, two infinite sequences of variables, t and t tilde, and these will be the generating function parameters in the examples that you're familiar with. Now, this is the important thing. It just follows from this representation by putting in into the operator product, you put in a uh, the, the identity element decomposed as the sum of projectors to the basis states. And that gives you an infinite sum over the partitions in which one side is just the standard fermionic representation of the Schur function, that's the vacuum expectation value of gamma plus, not the vacuum, the, the, it's, it's gamma plus acting on the basis state lambda projected to the vacuum. That's what the Schur function is. That's also an easy conjugation. And the other part will be exactly, by definition, the Bricker coordinate. So our expansion of our tau function in Schur basis, the coefficients are exactly the Bricker coordinates of the initial point. So if you know the tau function, you know all of these, and vice versa. And the Hirota bilinear relations now are just, this is a standard expansion. It's always the same basis as lambda, are just the Bricker relations. For this. Okay. By the way, is this running? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. We want to keep this for posterity. <laughs> or our students. Uh, same thing for Toda, except now, the, instead of having the Pricker coordinates of the, um, of the basis element lambda uh, shifted by G, we now have pairs. Uh, it's not just the vacuum projection, but we actually act by G on one of the basis elements and project it to another basis element. And that's what the double Schur function coefficient is all about. In most of the cases that you've seen during this week, uh, this thing is diagonal. And very often t and t tilde are identified, so you get the square of the Schur function. But nobody seems to have written down those Schur function extensions, so I'm going to do it for an example. Here's an example. Uh, 
Oops. Okay. No, this is not yet an example. I'm going to do a little bit more fermionic nonsense before I get to the uh, moduli examples. So let's now introduce some other elements of GL infinity, which are not the shift flow, but essentially the maximal torus. I mean, the diagonal elements of GL infinity acting as an abelian group. So, maximal torus of GL infinity. Here, uh, we want the elements for some reason to be non zero, so we'll write it as the exponential of some parameter, take the ratio and call it ri, you'll see later why I do that, and assume some convergence properties that I don't want to talk about. And think of this now as defining a Fourier series for a non vanishing function rho, or at least uh, two Fourier series, one which is holomorphic, which extends holomorphically to the inside of the disk and the other to the outside, and to infinity. And this re requirement allows tells you it will extend to infinity. I'm ignoring that. And now think of these, for each function rho of z, that is for each infinite sequence of ti, um, take the convolution product of that function rho of z with your element of L2s1. Convolution product, because it means multiplying the Fourier coefficient. So it's product on the Fourier transpose space, Fourier conjugate space. So the action of this group element, which is also a GL infinity group element, on an element of the, uh, uh, this here is a vector, it's not a, okay, sorry, this is, this is supposed to be a vector, not a, an element of S manual. So it's a, just an element of L2S1. Multiply the Fourier coefficients, and you've got a convolution product. So we'll use this in a couple of ways. I, I, I'm not sure now how time is going, but I'd like to get these examples. When you do the second quantization, the Clifford representation of this diagonal group action is given, of course, by the diagonal Fermi creation of annihilation operators, which commute amongst themselves. However, there's a little dot, 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 which every physicist knows, which is called normal ordering, where you either choose this or you use the anti-commutation relations to shift the order with an opposite sign, depending on whether i is positive and negative. The reason for that is because in the end, we're going to get things acting on the vacuum, which might, which are in danger of adding up to infinity. We want to get rid of that, so we make sure that all of the basic operators annihilate the vacuum, and these guys do. The pluses, you're trying to remove positive elements from the vacuum, you can't do it, it's zero. You're trying to add negative elements to the vacuum, it's all filled up, you can't do it, it's zero. So these guys are zero in the vacuum, that's how the, it, another way to define it is just take the operators and subtract the vacuum expectation. So with that definition, we have this Clifford representation of another abelian group, which is by no means equivalent to the shift abelian flows. And here I am introducing a factor. Uh, because this is diagonal in the standard basis for H, it's also going to be diagonal in the wedge product space. What is the eigenvalue? That's why I introduced this notation R. There's an easy formula which is very familiar from combinatorics and probably some calculations that some of you have done which associates to every partition, you take the Young diagram, you take your infinite sequence of numbers, ri, put a specific one, let's say rn into the top left-hand corner, so we're talking about a triangle. Should be something. Yeah, that's right. Here's your Young diagram responding to the partition. These are the parts, lambda 1, etc. Put in here Rn, and in the ijth place, put in Rn plus um, j minus i, which means you go up by one index to the right, and go down by one index when you go down vertically, and take the product of all of these things, all Rij's with ij inside of the partition. That is essentially the same. For various choices of that, you'll see various examples of you know, tau functions. But for the moment, it's just a calculus. Okay. Now here's a fact. If you take a group element g and apply to it left multiplication by one of these convolution group elements, you can relate the old and the new tau function, that is the one corresponding to g and the one corresponding to c rho g, by, by looking at the Brooker coordinates. Namely, you expand in a sure function basis. The old Brooker coordinates are here, and the new ones, almost by definition, are the eigenvalues of the convolution action. So they get modified. 
by a multiplication by such a factor, and it's guaranteed that if the pi's satisfy the Flicker relations, then the r multiplied by pi will also satisfy the Flicker relations, because it's simply a change in the group element by left multiplication. Similarly for the two total. So that's the conclusion that the Flicker coordinates get changed by this multiplication by this standardized factor. And now let's take an example where the it's essentially the rho is essentially the exponential, but for formal reasons it's 1 over z. And it only is on the right hand side, so this the left hand part we have coefficients that are just one. So notice the coefficients here are one over i factorial. You put that into your box to calculate, those are the ri's. You put that into a ratios of those, uh, which gives you one over i, into the box and you calculate. This is the formula for our lab. And now there's a very nice theorem, which I would like everyone to note. If we take what we looked at before, the partition function, the particular tau function is a partition function for um, the Hermitian matrix model. Uh, it's very easy to see that the Plucker coefficients in expansion of that partition are nothing but the determinants formed from the matrix of moments of the measure. If you take the measure, form the uh, Hankel matrix of moments, and form its determinant corresponding to each lambda partition. Those are the Plucker coordinates. Now you can do the same thing for Konsevich integrals and for Brezhan-Hikami integrals. And the two are related, so it's easier to relate it. Here's the Brezhan-Hikami. So here we have linear factor in A and M, and we're going to identify the TIs with the trace invariance of the externally coupled matrix A. That was like lambda in the Konsevich case, only there we had a square on the M. Here it's linear. As was mentioned, one can transform one into the other by translating the m by a constant, by multiple of a. So this, it's not obvious that this is also a tau function. But it is obvious, if you look at this theorem, you obtain this function from the previously defined partition function for an ordinary self-coupled matrix model by applying exactly the convolution symmetry of the example. That's the calculation. And it's done by looking at the coefficients in the Schur function expansion. So here's a theorem. Start with an ordinary matrix model. Partition function is a tau function. Look at a brezahi kami model and compare identifying the deformation parameters. They're related by this simple exponential convolution symmetry. I think that's the easiest proof I've ever seen of the fact that the brezahi kami integrals are tau functions. OK, now let's look at some other examples. Now let's look at the simplest case of Donaldson-Thomas invariance or Gromov-Witten invariance. Uh, so it's a different application, but they're related. Just for C3, well known, it's the, the uh, McMahon counting function for 3D partitions. So the expansion of this, uh, the coefficients tell you how many 3D partitions there are with a certain weight, and that's the same thing as the, um, as the Donaldson-Thomas invariant for C3 viewed as a uh, collateral C4. So that's a very special tau function, but let's look at it. You see it's, it can be expanded by standard by the, essentially the, uh, the, co, the co, uh, Littlewood-Richardson, no, Cauchy-Littlewood. There's, uh, there's a generating function for the tau functions, which is the Cauchy-Littlewood formula, or the Cauchy formula. Using that, we obtain this as a sum of squares of tau functions evaluated at this specialization. So the t's become exactly the powers, successive powers of a given parameter q. That's the parameter q, and that's an identity. So this is the most trivial tau function in the world. It's a two-total tau function where we've equated the two t and t tilde. We've equated to this specialization, and we've chosen as the group element the identity. So that, this, is a, this has a wedge product representation where you plug in the identity and plug in these specializations for the parameter. Here's some more example that should be dear to the heart of much of the audience. If you take just the, I think in terms of vector bundles, but take the sheaf, rank two sheaf, consisting over P1, consisting of O minus K and O K minus 2, that's also a toric calabial manifold, threefold. And it has also a generating function for its Donaldson Thomas invariance, which is again a sum, again over squares of. Uh, sure functions like before, and the coefficient happens to be uh, powers of the, of the two parameters in the expansion. Now we have a two-parameter expansion, little q and little q, 
where this is just the weight of the partition, and this is the, the kappa lambda is just the sum of the differences of the coordinates of, in the Yang, Yang tableau of the boxes. That's the content, the total content multiplied by coefficient k here. You specialize that for k equal to 0 and k equal to minus 1. First of all, for 0, you get back this generalized uh, McMahon generating function, which appears all over the place in Donaldson theory and in Okunko's papers and elsewhere. And if you do it for k equal to 1, then you get the sum, uh, the, the generator for the sum of O minus 1 and O minus 1, which is given by this. I should say there's some conventions. I borrow these conventions from, not from Okunko, but from Takasaki. And, and if you compare with the standard conventions, you have to replace both little q and big q by their negatives. Okay, again, we have certain specializations, T, I, F, Q. Again, this is the content. And the group element that gives this as the appropriate uh, matrix element is of the convolution type. You, you take two convolution elements, namely a linear combination of the, uh, basic, of the previously defined Ki diagonal elements with I or N as the weight or square. Take the exponential of that exponential q with that and this. And those are the group elements that you put into your formula for the tau function. And lo and behold, you obtain these generating functions. They can also be thought of, I guess you know this better than I do, as gromov witten This is the big conjecture. There are, they can also be thought of as gromov witten um, generating functions by looking at a different regime of convergence. Namely, instead of looking at q, you look at log of q and so on as the small parameter. So it depends whether q is near to to zero, or whether it's near to one. But if you do the two expansions, one of them gives you the gromov witten the other gives you the Donaldson-Thompson, reduced gromov witten equivariant. So here's some more tau functions.